begin with a prayer. Dear, dear God, we engaged in a tour of locations in Alexandria yesterday to review our past in order to acknowledge those events that have shaped our, our present. By engaging in this tour, we are acknowledging the sin of racism and how it has affected the church and our society. God, God, please, as we share our thoughts and, and reflections today, enable us to have the strength to dismantle racism. Enable us to communicate with each other our concerns. Enable us to follow your commandment and love each other as you love the church. God, thank you for the opportunity to fellowship with each other and to derive wisdom from our distinguished speakers. Thank you, God, for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to welcome uh, all of you to this adult education program. Yesterday, the participants in the reflective walk had an educational and moving experience visiting locations in the Alexandria area that explored how racism has influenced Alexandria history. We want to welcome uh, all of our friends who are, are, are visiting us via Zoom, including our brothers and sisters from the 15th Street Presbyterian Church to participate with us. And we encourage you during our time of discussion to share your re reflections about our presentation. I would like to introduce our guest speakers to today. They're all very distinguished. I Googled all, all of them and uh, going over their backgrounds would take a whole day to uh, do, but they're very distinguished and I'm very proud and honored to, 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 to have them here today with on uh, Zoom. Uh, first, the Reverend Dr. Larry Goldman. He currently is the Transitional Executive Director of the Reformed Institute and executive director of the Washington Theo Theological Consortium. Next, the Reverend Dr. Perzivia Prelo, pastor of the 15th Street Presbyterian Church in DC. She also is an adjunct pro, pro professor in African-American history at Bowie State. Uh, Mr. David Hybe, who is the superintendent of the Presbyterian Cemetery. Uh, yes, uh, 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 the Presbyterian Cemetery. Uh, right now, I would like to present the Reverend Dr. Larry Goldman for his opening remarks. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, welcome to all of you. It's a joy to see OPMH faces uh, and to, uh, to be with you um, this morning. A um, number of you were with us on the walk yesterday and we're delighted uh, to have you back. And those who could not be with us, we're delighted that you are here. I've been asked to share briefly how this walk came to be. Um, during the um, last spring and the summer of uh, racial reckoning for uh, our nation and for our communities, the Reform Institute Program Committee and the board wanted to explore um, new ways to engage the issue of uh, racial justice um, and issues of equity. And we began to think about uh, how our own tradition has been complicit, if not perpetuating injustice and how um, those within the tradition have fought that larger tendency. 
um, African American Presbyterians uh, doing so consistently and uh, finding white allies uh, from time to time in our history. So one a member of our board, um, very um, gifted gentleman, uh, realized that there were other walks of historical consciousness around the country. He sent us a link of uh, one of those walks and we began to uh, uh, di dialogue about how we might do a walk in the Alexandria itself, which has such a rich history, um, you know, even colonial uh, era to the present day and how Presbyterians have been interwoven with that history uh, in many, many ways. And we decided that perhaps we could do a Presbyterians uh, race and justice walk using sites uh, within the city to raise our own consciousness and um, initiate reflection, uh, prayerful reflection about where we as individual Christians, Presbyterians stand and where we as um, um, uh, co uh, congregations um, stand and where we want to move, how this might help transform us. That very gifted member of our board, by the way, um, is the uh, OPMH representative in addition to uh, Rocky, uh, Kent Myers. And uh, Kent uh, was instrumental in getting this walk off the ground. We um, collaborated early on with another network of churches uh, to help build diversity. And that was the Justice Formation Fellowship of the John Leland Center for Theological Studies in Arlington. It's a pan Baptist school and the Justice Formation Fellowship were about the same size as the Reformed Institute uh, uh, churches, about 10 churches, um, about 10 churches. Uh, of mixed uh, race, uh, some white predominant, some black predominant. Uh, and uh, they joined us in this, this first walk in September. So we wanted to, we did film that first walk and try to edit, um, edit the video into an educational um, format and um, Fortunately, the uh, uh, Dismantling Racism Task Force at OPMH uh, knew about it and, and some members watched the video, found it uh, um, educational and inspiring. So they invited us to do a walk uh, with church members. And we were delighted because part of the Reform Institute's um, interest right now is in how to better serve our member churches directly. So this was a win-win for, for us and certainly a, a convergence of uh, historic and timely issues around um, coming to grips um, and, and reckoning with our own uh, reform tradition, Presbyterian tradition, um, and the, uh, the very um, conflicted legacy that we have with race and justice and how we can move forward um, around that um, that set of uh, crucial issues for uh, God and God's kingdom. So that's uh, how it came to be. And uh, um, I'll be eager to answer any questions later that you might have. Okay, thank you, Dr. Goldman. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm gonna make a, a little change in the pro program. Uh, Dr. Prelo uh, has another engagement with her church at, at, at 10.45. So, uh, Doc, Dr. Doc Prelo, I'm gonna ask you to uh, pose uh, your, your questions and help moderate uh, the, the discussion afterwards, if that would be okay with you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much, Jeff. It's again, it is really good to be here with each and every one of you. And, and I'll be around for about maybe 35 minutes or so. Um, it's, it's wonderful that Zoom allows us to be with one another beyond um, the physicality of our church buildings. But for most of you who participated, um, let's begin with a more general question before I ask some more um, pointed questions. And um, I really wanted to ask you that as you experience this tour, what struck out to you the most as a historian? And one of my challenges when I was in grad school is that I always want to connect the past to the present. And sometimes my professor said, no, we study the past just to write narratives about the past. But I am a practical delusion. And especially living in the D.C., uh, Maryland area, history is 
part of our lived experience daily, but it provides a wonderful opportunity to, for us to reflect. And when we know better, we do better. When we learn from the past, we're transformed in the present so that we may respond to how the spirit of Jesus Christ is calling us to live out the justice of God. Amen. And so on this tour yesterday, um, myself and Dr. Goldman um, and all the, the other participant um, organizers from your church hope that the spirit came alive in you in some way. So let's begin with what struck out to you in the tour? How did you experience and encounter um, sharing in conversation with one another, the different sites that we had the opportunity to visit, or even the end of the tour when we found ourselves at the Freedmen and Contraband Cemetery? It was a deeply moving and thought-provoking experience. And I think we would do ourselves a disservice without first starting by checking in with one another. Would anyone like to share? Yes, Dana, is it? Yes, thank, thank you, Reverend. Um, so what, what struck me, my, my day job involves training federal judges when they come on the bench. And so one of the things we always do is take them to the Holocaust Museum mm -hmm. to show how in an earlier era, the rule of law was used to forward Nazi past legislation, just like uh, other, other laws. And so what struck me is when uh, Kent, I think, related the anecdote about gentleman Jim Robinson out in Fairfax County, a significant landowner at the time, and that it was fine for him to own hundreds of acres of land because he had been born free, mm -hmm. where, where the judges of that time were still enforcing the laws that would say, sorry, slaves are not humans, they're not in endowed with property rights. And uh, so this is just fine. So it's, and, and it's the same fear I have now that as we see efforts increasing to suppress voter registration and, and election participation, the rule of the law can again be used for the, for the wrong ends. And so I'm just struck by, you know, how we, we continue to face these same issues over time. Yeah, we most certainly do. And uh, history certainly repeats itself. It just shapes up in a different dynamic. And that's the beauty of history is that it reminds us of the past so that we can be more intentional about how we live in the present. Thank you, Athena. Other uh, reflections? Yes, um, Martha, yes. I was struck by just how much I glossed over. I grew up in Alexandria and I've passed all of those sites for almost my whole life. And while I knew some of them, it was just, I mean, I, I love that we took the time to really look and hear the history behind each each of the spots and it just it was very eye-opening for me thank you thank you thank you Martha yes Ellen yeah. Ellen if you can um can you all hear Ellen we couldn't hear you or turn up your volume yep it says you're unmuted your audio may not be connected uh-oh there we'll forget go. it. I'll, no, I'll no, come we, back. We can hear you now. We can hear oh, you. Okay. Um, basically, I just, uh, building on what Martha said, reminded me how much uh, racism and slavery and, and just the classification of people um, was part of our background. And we just almost didn't see it. It was sort of invisible. It was woven into the fabric of society. And um, that's something that current events and our present life we're trying to expose and change that's what i i, I got out of it so thank you ellen mm -hmm. other reflections before i reflect on your reflections <laughs> yes kate and then susan um i can certainly echo what martha said and um and i also appreciate the points that dana made and you know so like many of us who have lived in Alexandria for any length of time, you know, we know about the more distant history, you know, two, two and 300 years ago, whether it was the market on Duke Street um, and other places that we saw, but also other things aren't very distant at all. And, you know, big examples being the presence of Confederate flags or the presence of the Confederate statue that was sat in on Washington Street until what, less than a year ago. Um, um, so it just, you know, it's a bit, 
it's a bit troubling. I mean, it's, it's wonderful to see the steps that, that we're making um, in dismantling racism or attempting to dismantle racism, but also some of these things aren't very far in the past. And that makes me think, well, we're not very far removed from, from mm -hmm. some of this. Yeah. Also, Kate. Yeah. Susan, thank you, Kate. Thank Susan. you. Thank you very much. I came away with this thinking how much I don't know. Mm. And I we go to so many things and we, you know, we feel okay, we can do this. And then we really don't. You know, it's like I don't feel like we've moved for and I'm I should say I, I don't feel like I have moved forward a lot and I want us to keep going. And I don't know how to do that. Um, you know, we've read our books, we've talked with each other, but I want us to go as a group, all of us mm -hmm. together. And thank you very much for everything yesterday. It was, um, it was a wonderful four miles and um, just, just beautifully put together. And, and everything you all said was really meaningful and something to take home and think about. And I appreciate that very much. So thank you. Thank you, Susan. Yes, is it Jeff? Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, I just have a quick comment. Uh, the argument is always made, especially now, that why do you, why is slavery all uh, is always brought up? Uh, that happened a long time time ago. It is slavery is a reflection of how human beings feel about other human beings. Mm -hmm. In order to enslave another person, you have to believe that that other person doesn't have worth or doesn't have the same worth that you have. And so we had, and so that's why slavery existed in this country because vast majority felt that, that black slaves were of less value. Mm -hmm. And that also goes to any form of slavery. For instance, the Egyptians thought the Jews had less value. So they enslaved the uh, Jews. It's, so that attitude has perpetuated since, since modern American slavery mm -hmm. in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. And that's what I came away with. Thank you, Jeff. And um, more to your point, Jeff, uh, when you said that attitude has perpetuated since modern America, really since the founding of human society, amen, not, not to go back to the Garden of Eden, but uh, our society and our civilizations were birthed in sin. And sin is also too not being able to accept each child as a child of God. And so we have um, differences that we sometimes illuminate to, uh, to then translate into how we treat one another. But what we experienced on the tour yesterday um, was an example of a local history that has national um, relationships. But we can look at the whole arc of American history through this theme of how do we treat each other, whether or not we're talking about the Japanese internment, the Trail of Tears, we can look globally at the Holocaust. But it does raise a question, what I've heard in all your comments is, how do we reach the point where it becomes normal? that when we think about um, history, we live with the legacy, right? And the legacy is conflicted. Sometimes it's harder to talk about um, our past because in the present, we, we believe that we have been able to reflect back and reflect them back, we can see how it was wrong, but it's hard to actually do the work of unpacking. So uh, Susan, you mentioned a very good point and that is, you come to spaces like that wanting to learn more so that you can do and be transformed by it. And then it's almost as if you go to the experience and where do you go from there? But today what we're attempting to do is part of the next step. It is having the conversation that talks about our experiences. And then perhaps, you know, next time we have some kind of shared experience and we'll work even harder to get 15th Street um, involved. It's just hard to show up on a Sunday morning beyond our own worship space. But this is what we need to do more of across our presbytery. So in light of what you all experience, and I think we touched on this a little bit, I wanted to ask this, how does the experience of the tour um, uh, lead us to reflect in the moment regarding race and racial injustice? And then I'll point out a more specific, um, uh, the statue that came down, we mentioned, oh, it came down about a year and a half ago, but it came down a year and a half ago in light of a particular moment. Um, but then you also have all moments happening with monuments all across the country. I was a chaplain, um, I'm from New Jersey, but I was serving in um, ordination, the ordination path. And I was in South Carolina, Columbia, South Carolina. So I was there working as a chaplain at a hospital in order to be certified um, 
I had one unit of CPE, it didn't want to work in the hospital. But in any event, I was making my rounds and the chaplains um, who were interning with me sent the text and they said, oh, they're about to take down the Confederate flag. So I was there, I actually recorded a video somewhere on my phone. So I was there when they actually took down the Confederate flag and lowered it. It, it had, I'm not from South Carolina, my grandparents are. It had a, a monumental impact. And a mile down the road, I, I was also a professor at Benedict College. So for me, history is always, um, it's alive. It's not just dead. History is not dead. It, it is very much alive. So this uh, reflection, how does reflecting on the past lead us to understand um, where we are with race and race relations and racial injustice or the pathway toward racial injustice? So again, the question is, um, how does the tour lead us to reflect in the moment, right, regarding race and racial justice? Anyone? Yes, Marsha and then Beth. I think that uh, what I learned yesterday, I well, I should say have farmed because I'm doing a lot of reading and learning, is that in every period of history, there were people who were willing to go against the grain and do something that was actually at the time pretty controversial, but contributed to racial justice. Most you know, telling were the efforts to educate uh, African Americans uh, at, at up until the point where it really became super difficult to do that because of acts of the Virginia um, uh, General Assembly. So, I, so in every generation, there's there was something. There was, you know, Reverend Single in uh, uh, would have been the '60s, you know, mm -hmm. uh, fighting to, to um, represent well uh, and mourn with uh, with the city and the young people um, the death of uh, Reverend King and to try to get the Confederate flags down in the Memorial Day week. Uh, experience. So it's like now we need to ask ourselves what it is we need to do in this period. And in some ways, I feel like we we have fewer excuses because we are not fighting against quite the cultural um, suppression and suppression of the history that we have that we may be once did. So we, we just need to act. We need to take this moment and do as much as we can with it. Thank you, Marsha. Beth? Um, I wasn't on yesterday's walk, but I did the autumn walk. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, Dana Chipman's remarks are really right on target. And they follow with Marsha's too, that it's really concerning the laws that today are being passed by these um, state governments and I think we just really can't let up at all. We need to make sure that these things are not, and it, it's, it's hard to make sure that they're not enacted, but um, they're frightening. They're frightening because that is, I think, the systemic racism that goes on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any others reflecting on this particular question? Yes, um, Morgan and then Larry, Dr. Goldman. Um, thank you all again for your time yesterday and today and, and um, learned so much during the walk. So one thing that I think came through while we were walking yesterday and also just in conversation was access to education. And I think it's been touched on in this conversation and um, the courage that people had to make sure that people had an education um, and that, that access to education equals you know, opportunities. But one thing it, you know, we've been reflecting on too as part of the Dismantling Racism team is that um, there are so many inequities still within education. And how do we have the courage to um, look at policies in that vein too? It just, it just really struck me, Dr. Palo, when you were talking about the interconnections between the past and the present. And there are still so many um, inequities when it comes to education. And so that's just something I'm um, hopeful we can continue to take on and do that work too, because it does equate to so many opportunities too. Um, so I just wanted to share that. 
It does. Um, I, I said to myself at the end of the tour, certainly um, opportunities in terms of um, education and access and what better place than right here in our, our national um, our, our national capital in you know, Virginia, Maryland connected to it. But Presbyterians have a long witness of education. I didn't grow up Presbyterian. My first experience being Presbyterian was going to the Presbyterian Historical Society. And I was doing research on the role of um, Presbyterian missionaries going south after the Civil War to develop schools for African Americans. And wherever there was a church, there was a school. And wherever there was a school, there was a church. My first call was as pastor of a rural congregation. And that congregation um, had a school in a Calvary Presbyterian in um, Winsboro, North Carolina, Winsboro, South Carolina. Anyway, long story short, a person being educated in that school went on to come um, travel to Howard University. And so just this interconnectedness between um, the Southern, Southern Presbyterian experience and the Northern Presbyterian experience as well. When we went to Beulah, uh, we met uh, we met the pastor and we heard about the founding pastor. I couldn't remember his name, but then he was educated in a Presbyterian um, college in um, Pennsylvania. And so there's a strong interconnection. But what might this experience look like had it been part of a confirmation journey, right? And, and, and more of a, um, like a confirmation journey with uh, young people from 15th Street and from the meeting house. What, what might that have looked like if we had a bunch of young children ages 12 to 17 doing what we did yesterday? So I, I think we are, we are on the verge of um, being able to open, open our eyes more to how history shapes us. And so I wanted to ask another question. It was actually, um, I'll change it up a little bit. So, uh, Dr. Oh, Dr. oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Larry first. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Sorry. Um, I Building on the Beulah experience, they, um, I was on the first walk with you and with Beth and with others in the fall, but the, uh, the real fortuitous providential moment was when uh, Reverend Driscoll um, was at the front door of Beulah. They were doing a Mother's Day um, handout of, of uh, packages and ba bags and acknowledgements for um, families to share with their mothers. Uh, and uh, young, vibrant, uh, smart, Morehouse graduate, um, very engaging. He just uh, was willing to share with us the history of, of that church. And um, it, it struck me, um, it, telling the, the story, it was Clem Robinson was the, that pastor, uh, uh, Dr. Prelo, and, and being a graduate from Ashman um, Institute, now Lincoln University, um, which Presbyterians did found. And um, he came south as soon as he heard that uh, the Union troops had you know, taken Alexandria um, as their own. Uh, and he opened the, the first uh, African-American school uh, for um, previously enslaved folks and others who needed education. So, um, and he developed one of the early theological schools uh, as part of that uh, as well. Nonetheless, that Reverend Driscoll is just down the block, struck me as, wow, this is a moment, isn't it? I mean, uh, he was telling us of a consortium of uh, churches there on Washington Avenue, including very historic Roberts uh, Memorial, which is out of a Methodist tradition um, and some others. Um, and it strikes me that right within the, um, the community that we live in, excuse my clock, um, the uh, opportunities for engaging other uh, houses of faith uh, with very, very different traditions and very distinct experiences uh, is, is right there in our midst. And what struck me is, well, that's how it was in the periods that we were talking about. Uh, the, the, the Black neighborhood that was very close to OPMH was called Haiti, uh, honoring the, the symbolic freedom of uh, the Black revolt in Haiti uh, and all the other uh, communities that were surrounding the area that Blacks and whites lived close to one another, but lived kind of separate parallel lives. And now it's, it's the time to make those uh, interwoven lives, lives that, lives that intersect at many, many different points um, without losing, uh, of course, um, distinct uh, cultural identities. So I'm hoping that OPMH will take advantage. Reverend Driscoll is um, fired up to, I think, engage other churches. And uh, that, that struck me as just a living opportunity for moving forward together. Thank you. And um, thank you, Dr. Lohman. More to your point, uh, as Presbyterians, we always talk about reformed and always reforming, right? We, we, we live by, by that hope. Uh, when I hear that reformed and always reforming, for me, it's a hope that the church and as individuals, we are the church. Church is not just a building, but that we are always um, in Jesus, have the capacity to change. 
When we visit the past, we must engage in intentional steps that require transformation and reconciliation in the present. What do you all think is the mission of God for OPMH, for National Capital Presbytery? Uh, we could talk about the Presbyterian Church at large, but we can contextualize it. Uh, what do you all think is the mission of God for us in this moment to be the Reformed Church um, right where you're located um, and, and in the broader DMV as well? And how can we do that with intention? I'll get us started. I think it's to be able to have conversation so that we can learn more about each other beyond fear. Um, Morgan, there's a, a list of resources available on the National Capital Presbytery website about dismantling racism. And mm, maybe a couple of months ago, um, Black clergy persons of National Classical Presbytery, we put together a short video, it's probably like seven minutes long. But um, my addition to that video was that um, we must uh, learn to engage one another beyond fear. And it's, re it's understanding each other's history that helps to dismantle fear of the other, whoever the other might be. And Presbyterians have a very rich history. What we experienced yesterday um, along the tour was just a snippet. And we didn't really have the opportunity to go very deep. It, the, being at the Presbyterian Cemetery, the juxtaposition, right, that on the one hand, um, white Presbyterians are buried in a certain section of the cemetery. And then you have this other part, and noticeable differences, even just looking at the headstones, right? That the other area of the cemetery, Douglas, um, where African Americans um, were buried, just even wrestling, right? with the story that emerges from that narrative. And then the um, Contraband Cemetery, recognizing that more than um, 1,500 people were buried there. And that part of the history is that it was paved over. Uh, it was um, a gas station that was there and, and then a highway. And we're still unraveling um, that history in that narrative. So a lot of what we need to do is just avail ourselves of opportunities to engage and learn and grow. I think the transformation happens when we are first able to understand the history and then understand too our complicity within it, even our churches and our congregations as well. Yes, um, Ellen and then Catherine. As a first step, you say, what can we do? I mean, I know it's going to take some time because everybody's at a different place with COVID, but, you know, to start having some joint services, you know, with the, the services with the churches that are near us on Washington Street, um, you know, or doing activities. I mean, when we do um, the, the packing of the food to send overseas and things like that, I mean, really to, to start doing some joint um, activities would be a, or joint worship services would be great in my mind. Thank you, Ellen. Catherine? Well, I was really uh, energized by your comment about confirmation, which Noelle and I lead here at the church and um, in other programs I've done and myself, when I went through it as you know a 13 year old, we always visited lots of other churches, mostly to understand different worship styles. But I think in this case, we could absolutely tailor that to the context of our history, our shared history um, with you know two or more churches and, and maybe even the whole program, I don't know, but at least some touch points to open that conversation up with our young people, which is you know a helpful place, I think, um, to engage each other and certainly to learn about each other and our histories. And I, I think that would be exciting, whether it's this year or the next. <laughs> Dr. Goldman, yeah. Thank you, Catherine. Well said. Uh, just a footnote uh, for Catherine and others. Um, uh, the pastor at Heritage Presbyterian Church, Rob Erickson, who is part of the Reformed Institute, was on our first walk with um, Dave I, Hybe and Beth and, and Dr. Prelo. And uh, he uh, decided this is perfect for young people. So he took his youth group on a, a revised version of the walk. And he said it was just really powerful. So you might want to check with, with Rob, sure. you know, see how he shaped that uh, experience. Because I think it's, uh, it's something worth doing. And, and uh, if y'all have us move forward with that, Catherine, we'd love to learn from you about how to shape that perhaps as an ongoing RI program. Yeah, and if I could assist in any way with that, we'll certainly um, be willing to help out. Yeah, thank you. Um, other comments, and then I'll turn it back over to Jeff. What? Okay, Jeff, I'll turn back over with you, um, to you, and uh, if you have other moderators you'd like to transition to. Unmute yourself, yeah, there. Oh. 
Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And thank you very much for uh, posing those very thoughtful questions. And, and I do appreciate the, uh, the, the uh, feedback. Uh, in addition to what we were talking about, about things to do, I think a simple thing is, is organizing situations where we can just talk to each other and just communicate to each other. Uh, and that, that would be a very big first, a first step, whether it's worship opportunities or different pro, pro programs, but just a chance to just simply speak and just talk to each other and, and just get to know each other. Uh, uh, because I think once you get to know a person and speak to a person, then you begin to see that person as a human being. And, uh, and that I think can, 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 can start to progress. Uh, so, but I really do appreciate this. Uh, uh, I, uh, uh, I have a, I have one more question and I, that I'm going to pose. And it may be a redundant question, but uh, I think uh, it may offer us an idea of how to look at this. Um, um, when we are living our day-to-day -day lives, and from now here on out, we're gonna be passing these, these monuments again, but we're gonna have a different per, per perspective. How do we acknowledge what they mean and signify? And how do we look ahead in the future? We may have already discussed that, but I wanted to try to get a little bit more depth of how do we uh, look ahead into the future? Yes, Marcia. Are you going to unmute? Um, I got it. I think we all need to challenge ourselves to um, ask and wonder and investigate what else is hiding in plain sight. Uh, systemic racism, uh, you know, there, there are so many dimensions to this. And so we just need to keep asking ourselves as we learned in reading um, uh, Ibram Kendi's book, uh, you know, it, it, what, what are the unintended consequences of anything that turn out to be racist? And what are anti-racist policies and actions that we can take? And we got to um, stop being naive and very skeptical about how the systems really do work. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, also, I want to point out something. I, years ago, I had a discussion, years ago, uh, many years ago, and this uh, Christian told me that uh, racism went in when God will outpour the Holy Spirit and he'll change all of it. And I thought, okay, well, what do we do until then? Uh, that, was, that was my point. But I think God puts us on this earth, he, he puts people to do his work. Uh, he inspires people to do his work. And I, I was trying to, to look up the story of, uh, of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah when God was gonna destroy Sodom and then he went down and says, well, if I can find this many people and this many people and this many people, and it got down to, to, one, to, 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 to one person. And we think about the people on, uh, uh, on this tour, the pastor of, uh, o, uh, uh, of, of OPMH, that one man who stood up against racism. Uh, God inspires people to inspire and to have change. And, and of course it takes courage and it gives us courage in order to, to do that. But he inspired uh, uh, the Martin Luther Kings of this earth to, to lead a civil rights movement. He, he, he inspired 
uh, 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 he, he, he has inspired many great people, just one person that spoke up and had the courage enough to say, this is wrong and we're gonna make it right. And I think this tour has inspired me and hopefully maybe it has inspired you, you to ask God, what can I do? Mm-hmm. What, uh, how can I contribute? Mm-hmm. What little thing can I uh, do? Uh, I have a, I had a, I'm, I'm gonna be brief. Years ago, when I was growing up in Marion, it was very segregated. Uh, yes, it was. And uh, we had a math teacher. She was a uh, white lady. I have to use the term white because this puts the story in context. She was four feet 11, extremely intimidating. And she taught math. Uh, and Miss Elder was probably you may call a undercover person for social justice in, in uh, Marion. She did these little things, but you never realized what she was doing. I was having, my father asked me to sit at a voting booth to serve uh, as a, a poll watcher uh, because he didn't want to do it. That, that, that I couldn't figure out why until I sat with the people that, that I was sit, sitting with. They were not very nice people. They were gossips, which and then I figured out that's why he didn't want to spend all, uh, uh, all day listening to it. So he asked me to do it. Well, Miss Ellard and these folks were the most prominent people in Mary. Uh, they, were, they were very prominent but they weren't very kind folks. Ms. Elder, I walked in, she voted, and, and she saw me sitting at the table. She walked over to the table and spoke to me because I had been her student and she knew my parents. And she said, uh, and she said, hello, Jeff, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing fine. She said, uh, how is your mom and daddy? I said, they are doing fine. You be sure to tell them I said hello. Yes, ma'am, I sure will do that. She said, now listen, I haven't seen you in a long time. You come by my house and you visit me anytime you want to. I said, yes, ma'am, I, 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 I sure will. She says, you have a good day. Yes, ma'am. She turned around and walked off. She didn't say, uh-oh. Oh, darn it. Oh. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. Um, All right, I'll, 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 I'll come back up in a minute. The point of it is, she didn't say a word to those folks. It was a snub, that's, and that's what it was. But she was making a point to those folks that I had value. And in a small town, that was a big deal. Mm-hmm. Um, Jeff, can I um, jump in? Um, what I yeah. heard, what I heard you offer was the importance of recognition, the yeah. imp- the importance exactly. of seeing one another, the importance of acknowledging one another. Exactly. Um, you raised, if I can jump in, um, to just raise one point, then I'll transition out. You raised yeah. the point that how do what other or someone else said what other monuments are we living around that we don't see, and it's almost as if what other acts of racism or um, discrimination that we are daily living around that we don't see or that we pretend that we don't see. Yeah. So um, much like the the woman, the teacher, Jeff, she chose in her own way, in her own sphere of influence to figure out how can I be the change that I wish to see in the world. And that's exactly. kind of what I want to, if you don't mind, that's what I want to leave you all with. We all have spheres of influence in this world called um, life in this world called the church, in this world called OPM8, 15th Street, National Capital Presbytery. We all serve on a committee, amen. But when we think about um, how might we be the change that we want to see in the world, uh, many of us are not called to um, be on a cross like Jesus Christ. Many of us are not called to um, 
even attend the, the March on Washington like Martin Luther King did in 63 and other subsequent marches. Some of us are not called to engage in um, nonviolent protests outside of the Capitol building. But all of us have a way in which, even if you're working with um, confirmation students, all of us have a way in which we can be the change we wish to see in this world. And so I, I leave you with that thought because uh, those who, or, or the, the Boy Scout group that um, helped to do the first reclamation project for the, um, um, the African Americans buried at the Presbyterian Seminary. You know, how, wow, that was so inspiring to hear that, that story. So I encourage you all at OPMH to continue to do the work that you're doing, but as individual, because sometimes we think we have to come onto a committee or to be a part of a group to enact change, but in your own spheres of influence, you may not um, be doing this, wow, you know, way of fighting against social justice, however you define that. But if you can just even begin by picking up a book and, and reading another viewpoint that may be different, you may not have to agree with it, but at least expose yourself to it so that you can be in conversation. But then just think about your jobs, if you're retired, whatever it is that you're doing, um, you know, if you're part of a, a knitting group, um, I was outside of OPMH yesterday and I was like, that's so cool, a diaper drive. I'm taking that back to 15th Street. We're going to do that. So you think about ways that you can engage in um, promoting the, the justice of God that brings us into promoting um, collaboration across lines of difference. So I leave you with that. And thank you so much, Jeff, for reaching out and just all of you and Morgan and, and Dr. Goldman for just engaging and encouraging um, more leadership and participation across what divides us that really doesn't have to in this virtual space. But thank you all and look forward to being with you all more. Thank you again, Jeff and Morgan. Thank you so much, Dr. Prelo. Back to you, Jeff. Okay. Okay. Uh, does anyone else have anything else that they would like to share? Jeff, I hope you don't mind me jumping in just one minute. And I, go, I, don't, go, go mean, right. I don't mean to put Dave and Don on the spot, um, but we're so grateful they were able to join us yesterday and today and just wanted to um, offer to them if they have anything to add to the conversation. Um, this, this is Donald. I just add... I've talked to thousands of people, visitors to the meeting house, and the, uh, people, people in the, who live in the neighborhood, live two blocks away, who've never stepped in to our burial ground uh, just a few weeks ago. And to, they, I'll, I'll categorize them. They were two little old ladies. They happened to be, they were both Jewish, and we talked forever. Once, once we, I just started talking about the place and I knew something about their background and they knew something, and it's what Jeff said, they knew something about the meeting house. And when they learned all sorts of things, new things, right, right here in the neighborhood, um, they were just so appreciative, right? Was, people are appreciative enough that they sometimes just go right for their wallet and, and pass money to me. Um, and I think Anybody, anytime any of us are at uh, on the church grounds, if you see others, to, to go reach out and talk to them. And you don't need to know the whole history, but know that a lot of history has, events have occurred and the struggle has been long. I like to point out sometimes that with the two physical structures of the Basilica of St. Mary right next to Flounder House in particular, here you have the mashup of Roman Catholicism and Protestantism and had good relations on the ground forever, right? It's not sort of the, the, all the other stories that people know about clashes between denominations and everything else. And that people realize that right, events occur in small space, the small space of, a, of, of voting or the small space of just one-on-one -on -one conversations. And that's all important. And it's always engaging people and people uh, making discoveries that they feel comfortable also to ask their own questions, right? Sometimes I'm talking with people for visitors for an hour and it's because they keep asking more questions to, to know how the American experience has played out in the physical space of, of our little corner of the world. So to engage people, it's the same as what Jeff said, really. Um, and you asked me if I would, can you hear me? Yeah, you were asking me if I had some comments. Um, 
it strikes me when I'm working in the cemetery complex how that um, we still have a, a country or that's or that's semi divided because of race. Uh, last year we had over 300 um, services in this in cemetery complex because of uh, COVID, and I would say half of them were COVID. And um, certainly, my cem our, our cemetery, the Presbyterian Cemetery, we've only done a few services, and I suspect at least one was COVID. But um, there's a, if you, as you well know, there's um, 13 cemeteries back there. One is very active and that guy is very active because he has the least expensive services in the Washington DC area. And um, all last year throughout the um, uh, DC region, people flocked to his cemetery because they were so poor, they could not afford to bury them anywhere else except here in Alexandria. And um, so I, I was struck about how there is such a diverse um, uh, uh, I guess a, a, a large, um, uh, you know, I'm trying to say what um, diversity between the, the financial resources that people have in this area and how that people from Maryland and DC and uh, Virginia had to come to Alexandria to get buried because it's the least expensive cemetery complex in the Washington DC area. So to me, that's, that, uh, that's very sobering thought in my, in my mind. All right, does anyone else have anything else they want to reflect on? I just want to share a final thanks um, um, on behalf of the organizers and uh, the Reformed Institute for um, OPMH and Morgan and Jeff uh, coming to us for uh, this opportunity. Uh, we learn tremendously each time we do an event and uh, we want this to become a regular offering of our eye over time. So it's been very, very um, beneficial to us. And we're also very, very grateful that OPMH has been uh, one of the founding members of the Reform Institute and continues to be so strongly engaged. So I just um, wanted to share my gratitude. Thank you. Thank you so much, Larry. Um, before Jeff closes us in prayer, we also wanted to thank you, Larry, Don, Dave, Dr. Prelo, all those involved, um, Kent, who, um, who, who joined us yesterday. We're, we're so grateful and proud to be a sponsoring church of the Reformed Institute. Um, and again, I would encourage everyone to check out the Reformed Institute web, um, website, learn more about their important work, and we're um, grateful for the continued collaboration. Um, just two other quick reminders, uh, congregational reminders. The diaper drive is today from noon to 2.30. Um, socially distanced drop off um, on either Fairfax or Royal sides of the street. So thank you to everyone who's part of that. Um, and another friendly reminder, if you haven't already signed up for the focus groups um, around the capital campaign, there are details in the egram and on the website. So thank you to everyone for um, being part of those as well. Um, thank you again to the Reform Institute and everyone um, for this weekend, Larry, Don, Dave. Um, we're, we're so grateful. Um, Noel, did I miss anything on the announcements or, or Jennifer about other adult eds? Um, I'm happy to jump in just to let you all know what's coming next. Um, so the next three weeks, um, adult ed is gonna have a class um, on African-American poetry of the spirit. Um, and Linda and I, and Elise Jenkins, who's one of our choir section leaders is gonna, uh, we're gonna co-teach this class together. Um, Elise is gonna offer three, or I think, or maybe more if we're lucky, she's gonna sing three uh, African-American spirituals, one for each class. Um, and then Linda and I are going to offer a um, discussion on, we're gonna look at African-American poetry, both in the past and in the current moment. So. Um, poets, and I don't know if these are familiar names, but I'll just throw them out there. Of course, we're going to look at James Weldon Johnson, of course, Hayden Carruth, Derek Walcott, and then more contemporary writers like Tracy Smith and Natasha Trethway, um, Danica Kelly, Ashley Jones, Kevin Young. So some really powerful writers. Um, and we're going to look at themes um, that uh, resonate with that musical and poetic tradition. Thanks so much, Jennifer. And Jeff, a big thank you for leading our adult ed today and all you shared. Um, really appreciate it. You did an amazing thank job. Thank you. I, I felt like Johnny Carson, but uh, thank you very much.
and I appreciate uh, pre appreciate everyone's patience. I really do. Uh, I would like to close with a with a Bible verse uh, and a prayer. The Bible verse is from First Corinthians thirteen, and now these three remain: faith, hope, and love. But but the greatest of these is love. And this is the prayer. Father, you call on your followers to be the salt of the earth. As we go into the world, give us the strength and wisdom to combat the sin of racism that has divided your creation. Father, continue to teach us to love and as we love each other to establish your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you, Father, for the, for the wonderful opportunity you have given us to fellowship and learn from each other. We pray these things in your son's name, amen. May all of you have a blessed day.